Burns, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank you for coming here this morning to the National Library Service of Breast Cancer Awareness Lecture. But I want to introduce Ms. Jennifer Yard, the Acting Director of the National Library Service, to the podium to give her remarks. Dr. Peters, the Victoria, victorious warriors represented by Ms. Rosalind Griffith this morning, and other specially invited guests, the media, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, good morning and a warm welcome to you. Breast cancer knows no limits or no bounds. It is not only a woman's disease, but it can affect anyone, including men, but is more prevalent among women. The World Health Organization estimates that more than 1.2 million people worldwide are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. We can only do our part by sharing information and the lessons we have learned to empower more women to detect early cancer, which is the closest thing we have to a cure. Libraries have a major responsibility to provide people with the information they need through its collections and services. We are committed to meeting the needs of individuals and groups for education, information, and personal development. To this end, we have formed partnerships with supported organizations that have recognized that lifelong learning could assist in overcoming emerging challenges and help us undertake a more active social role within our communities. This is significant as, significant as it serves to fulfill the library's mandate to educate and to empower the people of Barbados. Breast Cancer Awareness Month is an important event on the library's calendar because it not only highlights the plight of women, but also is seen as an important reminder of the significant role they play in society. Throughout history, the central role of women has ensured the stability, progress, and long-term development of nations. Women are the primary caretakers of children and elders in every country around the world. They are the backbone of the family and the bedrock of a nation. They bring life into the world and their instincts are to care for the old, the sick, and those in need. Our mothers, sisters, and daughters share a core value of caring for others. When one family member has cancer, the whole family is affected. It impacts every facet of the nation. Today, we are showing our support of breast cancer awareness. It is my hope that as a consequence of this discussion and shared testimonies this morning, we will take the message beyond the walls of this confine and so stimulate persons throughout society, not only of the awareness of breast cancer, but in recognition of the mothers, daughters, sisters, and wives who struggle with the disease. At night, the library is lit in pink, the color of the cause. May our light continue to shine as a signal of support for breast cancer awareness and our commitment to saving lives through education and advocacy. On behalf of the National Library Service, I'd like to once again express thanks, sincere thanks to all who have made this engagement possible, and may we continue to be advocates for the cause. I thank you. My hope, and it's a very dear hope, is that more men will become aware of breast cancer. So I hope that men, you know, would really get aware and support their wives and support the female family which will be, you know, we we'll go a long way. Beyond that, let's get to the meat of the matter and introduce Dr. Adrian Peters. Dr. Peters is a consultant general surgeon committed to the management of surgical diseases in Barbados, including breast cancer and other breast-related conditions. He has been actively involved in delivering community lectures and promoting awareness in colorectal and breast cancer screening and the management in Barbados. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Peters to the podium. Thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for the invitation to talk with you essentially today because that's what it's going to be an interactive session um, with me leading the way on breast cancer early detection, investigation, and treatment. A very inter important topic um, across the entire spectrum of cancers. It is one of the leading cancers worldwide, particularly among females, and it is the leading cause of cancer death in females worldwide. It's a very important subject to discuss. All right. So before we go into the meat of the matter, just a basic structure, understanding of the breast. Um, sitting on the ribs, yes? Sitting from the second rib to the, second, to the seventh rib, and from the lateral aspect of the breast bone, what we call the anterior axillary. Refer to this region as axillary. 
and is divided into three lines, and three are made of posteriors, and sits in the anterior axillary limb. Yeah? It has a nipple and a pigmented area around it, which we call the angular. Now, it's a very superficial gland, lying between the fat and the skin, superficial and above it, and then it sits on a muscle which is deep to it. Right? So that is what makes it easy to remove in completion without much of any complication. Yeah? Now, internally, it has multiple lobes, about 12 to 20 lobes, as that essential for breast milk production and taking women, and there are dots that leave those lobes and join to form about 12 to 20 that are actually open onto the nipple itself. That is the basic dot structure, what we call the terminal dot lobular unit, which is the unit from which cancer in general arises. Yeah? In addition to that, it has other important supporting structures. It has a lot of fatty tissue, yes? It has supporting blood vessels, obviously. It has connective tissue to help hold it in place and keep it in its position. And it also has important what are called lymphatic vessels, which are similar to blood vessels. And you drain a different kind of fluid outside of blood. Yes? That's the basic structure of the breast in the human. So I want to talk about a couple of definitions, terms that we will see, terms that we will read about, but terms that sometimes we may not fully understand. The word tumor. The word tumor just generally means a swelling. Yes? In its widest sense, a tumor can be not just something that is cancerous or non-cancerous, but we can refer to a swelling like an abscess as a tumor as well. So the word tumor just generally means a swelling in any part of the body. However, the media and literature, when we speak about the term tumor, we generally use solid growths in its definition. Yeah? So solid growth, any part of the body. And obviously, it's an abnormal growth also. Neoplasia. Neo means new. The word neoplasia means a new growth. So something has appeared somewhere in the body, a swelling has appeared somewhere in the body that is new. We call that a neoplasia. Benign, a term we hear frequently. The word benign means not cancerous. Yes? And then we have cancer. The actual word that Many fear, rightfully so. This occurs when we have uncontrolled division of cells in any part of the body, which subsequently will go on to form a mass, and then subsequently can spread to other areas in the body. Yes? Another term that is synonymous with cancer is the word malignant or malignancy. So whenever we hear the word malignant or malignancy, we're talking about a cancer, something that has the potential to spread. Breast cancer, therefore, what is it? It is a cancer that starts within the cells of the breast, and any of those tissues that I mentioned, the cancer can start in. It can start in the ducts, it can start in the fat, it can start in the connective tissues, in the blood vessels, in the lymph nodes that sit behind the breast, and they can therefore give us different forms of breast cancer, depending on the tissue of origin. Yeah? Metastases. The word metastasis means spread. So when we talk about a tumor metastasizing, we're talking about the tumor spreading from its original site of origin to any other area outside of that site. So for example, if a cancer forms in the breast, we refer to the breast cancer as the primary lesion or primary breast cancer, but that lesion can spread to other areas. So it can go to the lungs and to the liver, for example, and we refer to those new deposits as secondary deposits of breast cancer. Yes? All right. Stage, a term that many tend to ask about. So the stage of the cancer, essentially, when we answer that question, it means we're referring to the primary cancer and any spread outside of the primary organ of origin. There are many staging systems for different kinds of cancer. 
Some of them very complex. I'm going to show you a slide with the staging system that we use for breast cancer shortly so you can get some understanding of that. Asymptomatic. The word is asymptomatic means a person has no signs or symptoms yet of a disease. The disease can exist within that individual, but they're showing no signs or symptoms of the disease as yet. Yes? Screening, a very important term. We use it a lot. What does it mean? It's very important to understand it. Screening means we are looking for a disease before it actually shows up, before it actually manifests signs and symptoms within an individual. Therefore, we are looking for it when it, at its, when it is at its earliest possible stage. Yes? Hence why we screen, to detect diseases, especially cancers, as early as we can. So I have here a slide showing the most recent breast cancer statistics in Barbados coming from the Barbados Cancer Society breast screening program extended from January to October 1st this year. We performed approximately 3,000 mammograms, about 500 ultrasound scans of the breast, 120 biopsies, and of those, about 50%, uh, about 50 came back positive, yes? This is just at the Cancer Society. It doesn't include those that have been done at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and by other private surgeons, yeah? The number of positive cases that we had from that lot was four under the age of 40. And that's important because we generally, uh, in the past, would have said breast cancer is a disease of a woman as she ages, usually above the age of 50, 55, but we're seeing it more and more commonly in women 40 years and less. Right? I've actually seen multiple cases of women in their 20s who had no family history of breast cancer. Risk factors. The risk factors for breast cancer are multiple. We like to put them in two groups because some groups we are unable to change but some groups we can change in order to reduce the overall risk of a woman developing breast cancer in her lifetime, yeah? Now, at this point, I'm gonna change focus. We're gonna look at the non-modifiable risk factors first. Those are the ones that we cannot change. And we have at the top there, female gender, yes? Which brings into account males, therefore. When we speak about breast cancer, we generally tend to speak of the female gender. Breast cancer does occur in males. I've had males that I've managed in Barbados with breast cancer, so it's here. Um, but just as a, an idea of how common it is in women compared with men, it's about 99% to 1%. About 99% of cases of breast cancer you will find in females compared with 1% or less in males across the world, yes? So female gender is a significant risk factor as we compare gender for gender. Advancing age is important. As a woman ages, her risk goes up. So that the majority of women that actually develop breast cancer are above the age of 55, yes? So as a woman advances in age, her risk goes up. Then we have genetic predispositions. Some persons can inherit mutated genes from their parents and can therefore be at a higher risk than the average population for developing breast cancer. There are multiple genes, but the strongest two associated with it that we've identified is the breast cancer 1 and breast cancer 2 genes, referred to as the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes, yes? Those mutations can be inherited, but they can also occur in an individual who does not inherit that mutation from one of their parents, right? So they can develop that mutation themselves during their own lifespan and pass that uh, gene onto their offspring, yeah? Family history of breast cancer, yes, we talk about the first degree relative, that's the strongest link, so we talk about your parents, if you have a sister or a brother with breast cancer, that also will increase your risk significantly. We have a personal history of breast cancer. So if you've had breast cancer previously and been treated for it successfully, you're at risk of developing, again, either in the same breast if you had conservation surgery or in the other breast is also increased. Ethnicity, 
It is more common in Caucasian compared with blacks and less so in the other ethnic groups. Uh, history proliferative breast disease. When we look at breast tissue under the microscope when we biopsy lumps, they may not necessarily come back as cancerous lumps, but they can be put in categories of proliferative and non-proliferative, right? A common form of proliferative breast disease is something referred to as atypical ductal hyperplasia. As much as it's not cancer, <clears throat> When we see it, we know that it increases a person's risk significantly of going on to develop breast cancer subsequently. So when we see certain diagnoses of proliferative breast disease with atypia or with abnormal cells, we increase our regard, yes, to look out for what can potentially uh, occur in years to come in such an individual. Yes, it poses a significantly increased risk of ovation developing breast cancer in that case. Early menarche and late menopause. So uh, your first period before the age of 12 or menopause after the age of 55, 60 will increase your risk factors compared with somebody who doesn't have those features. And the reason for that is one of the factors that drive breast cancer is the duration for which a person uh, is exposed to estrogen, yes? So the longer the years of exposure of the individual, the greater the risk factor. Chest wall radiation, when treated for other things, we used to use radiation for keloids, uh, certain lymphomas, which are certain blood cancers, lymph node cancers. Of the chest wall, when they were treated, usually on women under the age of 30, it was recognized that they subsequently went on to develop specific types of breast cancer, like the sarcomas, for example, which are highly aggressive breast cancers, but thank God, fairly rare. All right. Then here's our group. Here's the group that we should pay special interest to. This is the group that we can actually change ourselves to reduce our risk of developing breast cancer. Alcohol consumption, alcohol is linked to many different kinds of cancer and non-cancerous diseases. But there are many studies that have looked at alcohol, usually among the female population. And what they've recognized is that if one's limit exceeds a certain daily amount for a prolonged period of time, then it increases the risk of breast cancer. So for Beer, for example, you talk about 12 to 16 ounces per day, right? For your average wine, you talk about more than 8 ounces per day. And for the stronger stuff, 1.5 ounces per day. So prolonged use of that for an extended period of time will increase your risk of developing breast cancer and other types of cancer. Obesity, um, fat, fat cells, in the body in excess, uh, the body can utilize uh, it to convert to increased amounts of estrogen and therefore that higher concentration of estrogen, especially for a more prolonged period of exposure like we said before, will actually increase one's risk of developing breast cancer. Physical in inactivity is linked to many forms of cancer including breast cancer, so a sedentary lifestyle increases the risk Comparing two groups, women that have children, women that do not have children. Women that have children are at a reduced risk of developing breast cancers, uh, cancer compared with their colleagues or counterparts who do not have children. Yeah? So nulliparity is an increased risk. And not only is the fact that a woman having children protective, but the age at which she has her first child is also relevant. So what they've observed is that a woman who has a child less than at her first child at age 25 years or less actually has a lower risk than a woman who has a child 30 years or after. Yeah? Breastfeeding is also protective. Breastfeeding reduces your risk of developing breast cancer. So a woman who breastfeeds reduces her risk of developing breast cancer. Then we have the exogenous hormones in the form of the oral contraceptive pills. A person who takes that, especially for a period of more than two years, will increase her risk significantly of developing breast cancer. If that pill is stopped for a period of 10 years, then 
If she doesn't develop breast cancer within that 10 year period, her risk returns to normal after that 10 year post OCP use. Postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. So depending on the hormones that are taken, especially if they're estrogen based, will increase a woman's risk of developing breast cancer because it's exposing her to a further few years of estrogen unnaturally. So that will increase her risk of developing breast cancer as well. Breast implants, there are different kinds of implants. So they found that the implants where the surface is rough can actually increase the risk of developing special cancers of the breast called lymphomas, yes? Fairly uncommon, but they have been detected. So there are a whole list of genes that are associated with breast cancer. As I said, the most common two is the BRCA1 and the BRCA2, breast cancer 1 and breast cancer 2 genes. We know that we, the human has, well, the normal human, because you can have abnormalities, has 23 pairs of chromosomes, yes? 23, each from one parent. So 23 from the mother, 23 from the father, gives you 23 pairs, 46 in total, yeah? The BRCA gene is located on chromosome 17, so you get two chromosomes 17, one from the mother, one from the father. If you inherit one that is mutated, it gives you a 50% chance of manifesting one of the forms of cancers associated with those genes. And breast cancer is just one form associated with those genes. Another common type in females is ovarian cancer, and in males is prostate cancer. The BRCA2 gene is located on chromosome 13, same principle, one from each parent. If one is mutated, there's a 50% chance that one of the offspring gets that mutated gene. Yeah, and can manifest it. And then we have some other less common genes that can manifest as breast cancer when they are um, abnormal or when they've carried mutations, yeah? Now, one thing I want to point out, just like any other form of cancer, the exact cause of breast cancer is not known. What we have established are risk factors, yeah? So let's take the BRCA1 gene, for example. If a patient has the BRCA1 gene and it's abnormal or mutated, just to give you a rough statistic, there's a 65 to 85% chance that by the time he or she gets to the age of 80, that they can develop breast cancer. Yes, not will, but can, yes? So not because you have one of these genes, it means uh, abnormal, it means you will go on to develop breast cancer. Yeah? The risk of developing it is slightly lower with the BRCA2 gene abnormality or mutation. All right, signs and symptoms of breast cancer. There are a lot of things that can be, uh, become abnormal in the breast. Uh, they should not be ignored from a simple rash to something that looks like a little bruise. They should not be ignored, right? A rash can actually manifest as one of the forms of cancer referred to as Paget's disease of the breast. What we think might be a bruise might be an ulcerating breast cancer lesion, yeah? There's another form that can look almost like an infection, like a mastitis. We call an inflammatory breast cancer. It's a highly aggressive form of breast cancer that can present with pain and redness and swelling of the breast that somebody might just say, oh, I probably was stung by an insect. No, it could be one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer. We call inflammatory breast cancer, all right? So changes should not be taken lightly. All right, so common things, common things that present the breast lump, may be felt by the patient, patient's partner, patient's doctor, yeah? Common way that cancer can present. Obviously, not all lumps are cancerous, but all lumps should be investigated, yeah? Lump under the arm. You may not feel a lump in the breast itself, but you may feel a lump in the axilla. That can indicate that a cancer that has started in the breast may have spread to the nodes. We call them lymph nodes or glands under the arm. So that cancer has probably started to spread outside of the breast to new secondary sites. Skin ulceration. Lumps that are close to the breast, the skin of the breast, or as they grow, can actually cause breakdown 
of the skin surrounding the breast or surrounding the lamp. I have a picture to show you shortly. So we have to look out for those. Any bruising, as I said, should not be ignored, especially if it goes on for a prolonged period of time, two, three weeks without healing. It's very suspicious. Nipple discharge. Bloody discharge can indicate that there may be an underlying cancer of the breast, but the most reason why a patient would have a bloody nipple discharge is actually a non-cancerous condition called a papilloma or an intraductal papilloma. Yes? But still, bloody discharges need to be investigated. Or any kind of discharge, actually, if it persists, should be investigated. Breast pain is an uncommon form of presentation. Only about 5% of patients that have breast pain will actually have breast cancer, some underlying form of breast cancer. So pain, many people look for it and associate it with cancer, is not a very common form of cancer at all. In fact, most lumps that are cancerous will not cause pain in its early stages at all until it starts to invade or encroach on nerve endings and compress those nerve endings. Yeah? Are you in a rash? So if you see a rash developing around the nipple, it may not, it should not be assumed to be a fungal rash. It should be investigated to make sure it is not something called Paget's disease of the breast, which is associated with underlying breast cancer as well. It says quite normal for one breast to be larger than the other. But if there's a size change recently, then that should be investigated, especially if it's associated with other features. So when we start to get headaches, seizures, and visual problems, it generally means that our cancer has spread to the brain, and that is what creates these symptoms. Weight loss it generally means it has metastasized to many other organs. We have the organs that we commonly metastasize to. I'll show you on the slide shortly. Weakness, same thing, it means that the cancer cells have started to overwhelm the body. Cough and shortness of breath, you generally see it when it has started to invade the lungs and start to give you fluid around the lungs. It can also give you fluid around the heart also, which we call effusions. Jaundice, when it invades the liver and it causes significant destruction of the liver, that is when you manifest jaundice. Now, just to show you how advanced it is, you can take up out to 70% of a person's normal liver without them getting jaundice, yes? So it generally means that when a person presents with jaundice, that they have 60, 70% destruction of their liver by the cancer itself, which is fairly advanced, yeah? Loss of appetite. Metastatic cancers tend to do that, reduce your appetite. And then, of course, a common site that it spreads to, and some patients will actually present with it, is pathologic fractures. Simple things that cause a bone to break. So, for example, patient might tell you they try to sit on the chair, they hear a crack, and when down had a fall, leg broken, as simple as that. You do your x-ray, you realize a pathologic fracture. Or they lie down on the arm at night, they hear a crack, sudden pain, you shouldn't fracture that easily at all. So when these things happen, we have to look for cancers that would have spread to the bone and cause what are called pathologic fractures. Screening for breast cancer has been a significant topic of discussion for decades. There still remains a lot of controversy regarding screening across various countries in the world. As I will point out, some of the common ones. The first thing to know is that when you screen for a cancer, it doesn't prevent you from developing the cancer. It helps you to detect the cancer at an early or the earliest possible stage when it is easy to treat and possibly cured with the various forms of treatment that we have available. Yes, so it's all about early detection and treatment rather than true prevention when we screen for cancer. Another thing that is controversial is the age at screening. Now, there are many factors why different countries would screen at different age. As I said, one of them is ethnicity. So depending on the ethnic makeup of certain populations, 
the age of screening may actually vary. Another important factor is cost. Yes, depending on how much the country has in terms of a GDP that it can put towards uh, health care will also affect their recommendation of the age at which screening should be commenced and the succession of which the screening um, tool should be applied. So by screening tool, I mean, for example, a mammogram. Some people will say once you start, you screen every year. Some will say every two years. Some even go as far as every three years, depending on the sources available, yeah? So there's still a lot of variation in those factors when you look across various countries in the world, yeah? A lot of countries follow as the NCCN guidelines, or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. We follow uh, most of these guidelines also in the Caribbean, and they recommend that uh, women start their screening from age 40 years. And of course, in Barbados, we know we do 40 as well. Now, this is a study, uh, this is an extract of a study that was performed in 2011 by Professor Anselm Hennis et al. on breast cancer screening barriers among women in Barbados. Yeah? And some of the things that he highlighted in this study is that women reported that the education for breast cancer was uh, low, somewhat low. Literature available was somewhat not available. But I think we can fairly say from 2011 to now, the Barbados Cancer Society breast screening, Dr. Jagru and her team, has somewhat tried much to change that. And I believe with some effect, because we're seeing an increasing number of patients coming every year as we look at the graph for the various screening investigations. So I would like to believe that that is changing slowly Knowledge is getting more and more out there regarding breast cancer and breast cancer screening. Another factor that he highlighted was the fear of mammography from two perspectives. Women were fearful of the amount of radiation that they were getting from the mammogram. That is a very, very low dose X-ray radiation. Nothing to be concerned about whatsoever. And the pain associated with it, yeah? Um, especially when the breast is being compressed to get your various views. Uh, pain essentially can be manifested by a number of things. It may have been a, a case where the woman went around the time of her cycle, her period, and therefore would have experienced some abnormal or unusual discomfort, I should say, as a result of the compression. It might be as a result of the underlying disease process and getting a mammogram at the same time manifesting the pain. Some women with dense breasts or large breasts, the compression may also have had to be more. Many things have been done to change that. Up to recently, we have a new machine at the uh, breast screening program there at the Cancer Society that will reduce both the pain because it can allow us to image larger breasts with less compression and it also would have to reduce repeats because sometimes when you have, well, the old or old model machine, you would have to call a patient back to repeat mammograms if certain suspicious lesions were seen to get what are called magnification views. With a new machine, we don't have to do that to get magnification views. All right. And then there's the potential fear of consequences of manifesting a positive test eventually. The social stigma, that is, I think that is reducing also. That was associated with a diagnosis of breast cancer. There are a lot more support groups and education out there. And then there's a uh, loss of romantic relations as a result of diagnosis and treatment. Um, I must say over the course of the years too, from personal experience, I've seen a change. I've seen a lot of partners accompanying um, wives, etc., with uh, breast cancer, which of course is a plus, support groups starting from home, and then of course there's the cost. We know that mammography is not offered at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, so all the facilities where patients would have it now 
will be private, and of course the costs will vary from facility to facility. Treatment of breast cancer, of course, is still offered at, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, well, from surgery to chemotherapy to radiotherapy and other forms of treatment. All right, so imaging tests that we use for breast cancer screening, the mammogram is the most common tool that we use. Uh, that's the conventional mammogram. The one that I was speaking about just now is the tomosynthesis or the 3D mammography. We have a machine that can do 3D mammography currently, recently, only a couple of weeks actually. So we've actually advanced to that. 3D mammography can actually pick up more lesions than the conventional mammogram. And as I said, it will tend to less to miss lesions in persons with large breasts or very dense breast tissue. Breast ultrasound. Ultrasound scans of the breast we generally as a tool to supplement mammograms in a woman very dense breast tissue. Yes, the denser the tissue, the harder it is for a mammogram to actually pick up a lump. Whereas an ultrasound pick up a lot more easily within dense breast tissue. So we utilize it there for patients with dense breast tissue. Um, why we generally tend not to use it in elderly? It's as a result of a variation in the glandular to fatty content of the breast. As a woman ages, the glandular tissue gets less and the fatty tissue gets more by ratio. So the mammogram becomes more sensitive test as a woman ages. Whereas in a younger person, so for example, if you are to screen a high risk person at age 30 because of a strong family history of cancer, you will actually opt for the breast ultrasound over the mammogram because the mammogram will have its lesions within the actual tissue compared with the ultrasound. Then we have breast MRI, same principle. We tend to use it when looking for lesions that are not seen on mammogram or ultrasound or to screen younger age group females who would have dense breast tissue. Then there are a lot of experimental imaging techniques that are available out there. They're not commonly used because they are, one, expensive, costly to get the machines. Many of them use radioactive material, which of course is difficult to handle and dispose of not to mention the cost of the machines themselves. And more importantly, it exposes a patient to radiation. And obviously you wouldn't want to expose a patient to that kind of radiation year after year after year of screening. So they haven't uh, taken up. All right, so we screen, we see something suspicious. Now we examine, we find something suspicious. What next? Those tests are all just tests that can give us an idea that something can be cancerous. The way to confirm it is to look at it under the microscope and determine if there are cancer cells within the tissue itself. So how do we get the tissue? We have to do some sort of biopsy or aspiration. These are different kinds of biopsies we do, stereotactic biopsy. We can actually use the mammogram to remove areas and send it for a pathologic assessment. Cornea, we can do it for large lumps or for smaller lumps, you can use ultrasound guidance where you get a little injection to numb the skin over the lump and you put a needle into the lump and remove samples of it to submit for analysis. Incisional biopsy where you have, cell I'm using now, where you have a large lump and you just take a little piece of it and submit it to the lab. Excisional biopsy for the smaller lumps, you can completely remove the lump and send it to the lab for, for uh, analysis. Hook wire localization and excision, we do it for very, very small lumps, or what we call calcifications. So these are things that you can feel. They're very small, millimeters in size, yes? You generally use a special wire, which the radiologist will put into the lump or into the lesion and the surgeon will follow that wire as a guide to find the actual disease area and submit the wire along with the disease area for analysis. And then we can actually use a fine needle to just remove cells or fluid and submit that for the cells to be assessed to see if there is any cancer cell 
There are various types of breast cancer. You're going to see different names. The two that you probably will see most commonly is the one at the top, ductal carcinoma in situ, and the third one, invasive ductal carcinoma. Those are by far the most common types uh, worldwide, not just in Barbados. There's a difference between the word invasive and in situ. In situ means that we have picked up the cancer very early at a stage where it has no potential to spread. Right? So in situ cancers do not spread. As opposed to the term invasive, whenever you see that, those cancers have the potential to spread and go elsewhere. So after we would have confirmed our diagnosis, the next step that we commence is staging. Yeah? Where we're looking to see if the cancer has actually started to spread and go elsewhere. Right? So we can do an ultrasound, for example, under the arm to see if there are lymph nodes under the arm that are big. And we can sample cells from those nodes to see if those nodes carry any cancer in them. We also start with a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to look at organs like the liver, the lungs, the spine, etc., to see if there are any deposits within those structures. And breast cancers can spread to just about anywhere, but they're common sites. Like, as I said, the lungs, the liver, the bone, the brain, yeah, are the most common sites. But they can go elsewhere. So how is the staging done? We, we use what's called the TNM classification, the most widely used classification system worldwide for staging. And it, it, we have a system for just about every kind of cancer. So the one we're focusing here is the TNM breast cancer staging system. All right, where there's T stands for the tumor size, N stands for the number of lymph nodes that are involved, and M stands for metastases. When we talk about nodes, however, we're generally speaking about the ones under the arm, or the answer, right? And we look to see how many nodes are actually positive in the submitted specimen. Now, in your reading, you may also come across something called a sentinel lymph node. So at surgery, we do not always have to remove all the nodes under the arm. If there are no nodes that we can feel or seeing, not seeing them on ultrasound, then we can perform something called a sentinel lymph node, where we give you a special dye or radioactive material around the lump. It drains via the lymphatics into the nodes under the arm, and we sample those nodes that either are blue from the blue dye or exhibit a certain level of radioactive material after having traveled through the lymphatics to the vein. We call them a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then we have M, metastases, any spread outside of the lungs, of the breast and the lymph node itself. So any other area where the cancer spreads to is considered distant metastases, and therefore you have a positive M. All right, so let me break it down a little for you. As I said, it's a complex staging system, so a lot of things to take into account. So this is the T category, yeah, T category, and it's all based on size, yes, the size of the lump itself. Obviously, the bigger the lump, then the higher the T stage, yeah? T4 is a general category when it starts to locally invade. So it starts to grow into the skin and cause the skin to ulcerate, or it starts to grow into the muscles and get stick to the muscles, yeah? Right. M, the number of nodes, we can assess up to 12 nodes, and you get an N status. M is usually M0, metastases not present, or M1, metastases present, yeah? And then we combine the T, the N, and the M to give you the overall stage. And then treatment. Treatment is wide-based. There are a lot of treatment options. There's surgery, surgery where you can remove part of the breast, the entire breast. There's prophylactic surgery where, for example, if a person has the BRCA1 or 2 mutation, you remove the breast because the risk is so high. Or some person may have cancer in one breast and the, one, the other one removed prophylactically because they are at increased risk of developing cancer in the other breasts, right? 
Then there is reconstructive surgery. After the breast is removed, you can put in implants. You can use special muscle flaps to recreate a, a breast mount. We have our radiotherapy, various forms, various kinds of machine. Chemotherapy, lots of lines, lots of different options. Hormonal therapy, one of the things we do after assessment uh, confirmation of breast cancer is we do what I call receptor testing. So we check the cancer to see if it has estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and another receptor called a HER2, or human epidermal growth factor receptor. And that will help to guide us if we can use hormones or other forms of treatment like targeted therapy, for example, in these patients. Targeted therapy is a little different from chemotherapy. What targeted therapy does, whereas chemotherapy targets the cancer cells and kills them, the targeted therapy is there to prevent these cells from multiplying or to make the environment hostile enough that the cancer cells cannot survive within the environment. Immunotherapy, this is therapy that is designed to help the body's immune response improve to an extent where it can start fighting off some of these cancer cells along with some of the other treatments to make the um, overall treatment more likely to be successful. And then there are bone modifying drugs that we can use to reduce the likelihood of spread to the bone or to treat cancer when it has spread to the bone. That brings me to the end of the presentation.